be seated. Good morning. This is a, a gospel that is sometimes uh, pastorally difficult. The reason is, is if you have been part of a divorced household, or maybe you're a divorced person, it's hard not to hear this as condemnation for some reason. I, I know this is from preaching on this text multiple times over the years, and even in my own family of origin, uh, my, both my parents had return policies on their spouses. <laughs> so mom was married three times, dad was married four times. Um, so I understand that reality of, of the pain that can sometimes be in relationships. And so sometimes when we hear this, it's hard, it's hard to hear it because it, it does feel often that way for people. And having preached on it over the years, so uh, I, I want to kind of get you to hear it a little differently. While the context is marriage, what Jesus is getting at is a gospel value, I think, all of us can relate to. This is one of those stories where Jesus is being challenged by the leaders of the time, and they're trying to trap him. In other words, they're asking him questions, thinking they can get him in trouble, so to speak. And he'll say the wrong thing, it can be declared heretical, or he'll say something that's not quite right. And Jesus is very well aware of that dynamic, but he's also challenging the understanding of time in terms of trying to get what the Sadducees and Pharisees and others had taught to be more open and more uh, alive with God's love. In other words, they were marred down in rules and exacting what something meant versus the higher value of finding God's love and God's kingdom. And part of why we can see this is juxtaposition with this story that he tells is this interaction with the disciples in which they're trying to keep the kids back, right? And he says, no, we have to let the kids come forward. And in fact, you should receive God's kingdom as if you're a little child, not as if you're you know, a real ritualistic adult who can't see past their own selves, right? That's part of what Jesus is sort of getting at, at that. So I want to focus on one particular word, that's hardness of heart. Now this will be kind of interesting. A little, Kelly's a little better at the word search stuff than I am, but I'm, I think I got her on this one. Um, the word that's here is sclerocardia, which you might know um, in popular terms as car cardiosclerosis. So you know what cardiosclerosis is, right? It's hardening of the heart in the artery. So literal translation is bordered a little different in English, but that's the actual word that is being used here, is that. So this is not that Jesus is saying, don't eat fried foods. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't, but that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is talking about is the Greek and Hebrew understanding of the time, which is hardness of heart, refers to a heart or a being that is unfeeling, unresponsive, and unmoved, and it's particularly used in a variety of places throughout Scripture, and it's directed at when you're witnessing human suffering, you have a hardness of heart. You have an unfeeling, unresponsive, unmoved response to what you see. But it's also about the unresponsiveness towards God's word and mercies and love towards the person that's hearing it. So this comes up, and it's, it's, it's a word that's figuratively talking about the center of human life. So the Greek philosophy of the time and Hebrew philosophy and others believe that our whole being was centered right here. Um, they didn't quite have the same understanding of the brain uh, that we do, but they thought that your whole being was centered here. So that's the center of your life. It's the center of your personality. It's the center of intellect, emotions, and will. And so to have that hardness of heart means not to respond with empathy and compassion and in other ways. One of the times when he uses, when Jesus uses this, is when he appears to the 11 after the resurrection, and he finds that they're reclining at dinner. So they're sort of relaxing and reclining. And he reproaches them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart, that uh, sclerocardia, because they do not believe that they had they didn't believe that other people that had 
come and told them that, that they had seen him. So they didn't believe Mary and the others that came to them and said, we just saw Jesus, Jesus was raised from the dead. They didn't believe him. That's another moment when hardness of heart is there. God also repeatedly hardens Pharaoh's heart in, when Pharaoh is keeping the Israelites in bondage to the plagues. And in Deuteronomy, one of the verses that talks about the same kind of concept is that th there's a verse that instructs people not to harden their heart against the poor, but to open their hands to the needy. So think about that for a minute in terms of what Jesus is saying in here about hardness of heart, right? You see, the, the divorce situation in Jesus' time was pretty simple. The male could just simply say, I'm divorced. And then the woman would no longer be married and then would no longer be able to reside in the household, would not be able to own property. And by Jewish law at the time, if they're living in that community, could not marry again and was basically put on the streets. And that's the reality of that time. And what Jesus is coming at, he's saying, you know, you're asking this question because of your hardness of heart. And you have to have this law because of your hardness of heart, because of your lack of feeling and compassion and understanding and empathy and, and relationship. And you have to remember that marriage was not romantic in Jesus' time. There was no flowers and cards and Valentine's Day and courting was arranged. And it was the exchange of property as part of the marriage ceremony. You would receive cattle and, and land and other things. It was, it was nothing like what we understand marriage to be. That sort of romantic notion and idealistic ideas of love and all those different things. And so that's the importance of hearing the scripture in that context and not necessarily getting caught up in what our context of the brokenness of relationships in our own life. So let's talk about that hardness of heart. I was at a, a really wonderful funeral yesterday at another congregation for a friend of mine's mother and a friend and a woman that I knew very well. And he used a term in his uh, talk that I just really loved. He said, we're, we're living in a time of heightened political pulse. I just kind of love that. And went on to say, you know, the political pulse is always present with us in this society. In other words, we're always sort of aware of our, our you know, divisions and disagreements and the realities. But right now, 30 days out from a presidential election in a heated moment, it is pretty loud and maybe that's the only thumping that you can hear. I just kind of love that image. It was a great way to think about it. And we're hearing a lot of what I sometimes think is hardness of heart being elevated in this moment. I am just gonna give you an example of what I mean. I wanna talk about what happened with the hurricane and the, the, the level of destruction I think we're, we're just beginning. For those of us that are far away from North Carolina and the Georgia and Florida and places like that, we are far away. We might see some media images, but the reality on the ground is, is so overwhelmingly difficult that I think we can't even fathom. We just can't fathom the kind of destruction. The Diocese of Western North Carolina, which is in part of the area where the really horrible floods have been, um, and the flash flooding and the mudslides and all the different things that have happened, they reported through their cathedral that 28 of the congregations in their diocese are incapacitated and likely they will, their buildings will be unusable in the future. That's not 28 in one town. That's not 28 in one area. That's 28 in a third of the state of North Carolina, a broad area. And that's one part of the community, a very tiny sliver of the community, just thinking about congregations. I want you just to imagine that our diocese has 44 congregations. And their diocese is a little bit bigger than ours, but not that much. That's the level of difficulty that they're dealing with. And I think the hardest of heart is showing up in there's sort of a hyper-criticism of, of what the government's trying to do in its rescue effort, whether it's federal or state or local, and there's all kinds of accusations. And the hardness of heart is because it's convenient for the political polls to kind of get what we want, right? Or maybe to get the right people to vote a certain way because this person or that person, it's not about the compassion and the reality of the suffering that the people are going through. This is the time for everybody to work together because millions of people are suffering. 
And that's the danger of that hardness of heart. And that's one place that I think we can talk about. Now, how many of you are Native American? Just a few, have some Native American in your, a couple, okay. You guys are, don't have to listen to this. <laughs> that means the rest of us in this room, right, probably had relatives that immigrated here. What do you think when you see someone who's an immigrant? And think about the words that are sometimes put around people who have immigrated. Think about that just for a minute. Hardness of heart. I did my own, in my family of origin, my, part of my family came from Ireland. They left Ireland um, in the late 1800s, and they left because there was famine, and there was difficulty, political difficulty, and, um, you know, incredible poverty. And they, they had a chance to come to the United States, and they came, and they, they were early land settlers in Kansas. They were settled in Chase County and Butler County and down by Coffeeville. And they literally, there's, we found a paragraph that's written where they went to the post office near Emporia because they were supposed to meet somebody there, and there was one small building and a stick that said post office. And there was no, they had seen no other people for three days. And they were escaping something that was horrible only to come and to have to work really hard to eke out some kind of life. And I, I, I've seen pictures and and the realities of what they were living in. My grandmother had no birth certificate because she was born in Oklahoma Indian Territory. She was a Sooner. So she was born in Oklahoma, never had a birth certificate because of that. She was born outside of the United States. These are some of the realities and the poverty that they were facing. And so I stand on the shoulders of people who made sacrifices and realities and left their home country to give something, right? more opportunity, and so every time I get a chance to go to school, to college, to work, to have the freedoms that I do, to have the home that I own, I have to think back to those people in that generation that made that long journey to this place. So the many immigrants who are coming into our communities, where is our compassion and empathy? Where is our willingness to listen? Where is our willingness to reach out and to incorporate and to bring in. Instead, we have a hardness of heart. We have a pushback. We have blame. We have projection. We have accusation. These are some realities that I think when we hear the scripture that we have to take it literally to heart in our own lives to think about. I bet if I ask you to raise your hands, I'm not going to, but many of you have in your own family people that don't talk to each other anymore, maybe for months or years or decades, or people who can't come to the same events together or other kinds of realities. And sometimes when you dive in, they're not really sure what they're still fighting about. <laughs> but man, it's not going to happen. It becomes that sort of that place where we get hard, hardness in ourselves. Or sometimes we have it within our own households or within na with neighbors or with others where we're living and it's that unfeeling, uncaring, discompassionate reality in which we just don't want to see our fellow people or humans for who they are in their own suffering and challenges and realities. Now, I'm not talking about abuse situations, okay? If someone has been abused or, or is abusing someone, you should not stay in a relationship like that. That is not about the hardness of heart for the person that needs to leave, to need to be out of that situation. But it's, I think, a reality for all of us. This is what Jesus is trying to get across to his disciples. He's pushing them, right, and helping them to understand the, the great thing about the disciples is they get it wrong all the time. So it's, 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 it invites us in, in our frailty, in our learning, in our, in our need to sort of continually grow and develop, to understand that the disciples, even in their chosenness, like in today, they just didn't get it. They tried to keep the kids away, right? He's like, come on, guys. You're not hearing the message. You should be like these kids who are so eager to come and to be part of who we are, 
That should be how you come to the scriptures, how you come to God, how you seek out God's love. And that's part of what we're called for. So what do we do, right? It is for all of us as people of faith to live out our compassion and our empathy and to let our heart be open to the realities around us. Even when the pulse of the political world is loud and drowns out sometimes the other sounds that we need to hear, it is to not forget what we're called to be. I was serving St. Peter's in Conway, Arkansas when Katrina hit um, New Orleans, and that's about six hours away from New Orleans, so in the neighborhood, so to speak. And if you remember that, it was a devastatingly large storm, and it pushed back and pushed over, the water pushed over uh, dams and other things that had been built that they thought would, would hold a storm like that back, and it didn't. And a lot of other things, the, the storm kind of came up and then it kind of parked and just dumped a, a massive amount of water into an already water-soaked area and caused incredible flooding and destruction. And people were left uh, without anything or any services or any realities for several weeks. And we got a call in Conway, our mayor got a call, Tab is his name. Uh, he got a call from the government and from FEMA and said, we're bringing people to your community, can you house them? And the number was between 1,500 and 2,000 people for our community of 40,000 people to house. And Tab, of course, said, absolutely. And then he called all the pastors and priests and other people together and other community leaders, and he called us together, and he put the African-American pastors in charge because we thought that most of the community coming was from the African-American part of New Orleans. He put us in charge and, and then worked with us and challenged us to do what churches do best, and that was to create a whole lot of potlucks for these people <laughs> and to put beds together and to figure it out. And we opened our schools and our community centers and we made shelters practically overnight from the resources from within the churches and other community partners. And we went to work and we worked with FEMA and we got organized and some of us were on the intake team, and some of, us, some of us were on the food team, and some of us were on this team, and some of us were doing this other stuff. And it was chaotic, and nobody really knew what anybody was doing, and we were doing the best we could, and then all of a sudden the buses came, and it was 2,000 people. In the beginning, I helped with some of the intake, and we would meet people, and we'd just kind of get their names and get them entered into the computer and help them apply for the aid that they could get to help them so that the FEMA could get them rehoused as soon as possible. And there were world famous jazz musicians. There were doctors. There were lawyers and teachers. There were people who were poor. There were people who had been separated from their families in the disaster. People who couldn't reach their families, couldn't call, had no access to a cell phone or telephones. Mothers who were separated from their kids because the kids had gone somewhere else with with another person to get safety or they had floated this way or different realities and, and, and people from all walks of life who had it all together a few days before and suddenly were in this abject moment of need. Now our mayor could have been hard of heart and said no. Our mayor could have doubted our ability as a community to pull together. We could have fought with each other the the, 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 the pastors and, you know, the, the people who were pastors of the giant churches in town, which were white churches, could have fought about the African-American people being put in charge. There could have been all kinds of realities, but that wasn't what it was. Everybody understood the mission of compassion and reality and that we had to do something that was the right thing to do in that moment. And Tab, in his leadership, let that heart flow with love. We have to remember this in all that we do. That when we encounter some of these difficulties of the world, that that's the place that we're called to be. That's where Jesus wants us to be with our heart, with our being, with our soul. Is to act back, right? Is to move out of that place 
and to not be part of heart. I want you to take some time and think about this this week because I think it's something all of us need to self-reflect on. What is our hardest of heart in our life? Where is it that we're clogged up? (laughs) We're not able to reach out. We're unwilling to, to do that hard work. But where are we also willing to live out the way that Jesus wants us to live out? To be a people of compassion and empathy and to let that reality come forth from us. The political pulse is loud, but our discipleship is where we're called to be. And Jesus calls us to not be hard of heart, but to be people of the light and the love of God. Amen.